Welcome to the online worship service of Beautiful Savior Lutheran in Waukesha, Wisconsin. I'm Peter Schmidt. I have the great privilege of serving as pastor here at Beautiful Savior. Somewhere along the line, that will change. Someone else will have the privilege of being pastor here at Beautiful Savior, just like Pastor Bruss and Pastor Betcher were pastors before I was here. But you know, change is inevitable, isn't it? But change can sometimes be very difficult especially when we're used to things being a certain way, comfortable with them being a certain way. We're going to hear all about that as our message series on the Acts of the Apostles continues with Acts chapter 15 today. But our scripture readings will remind us that in the midst of a changing world and changes that happen in our life, what God wants us to be is very consistent as far as our total commitment to him nothing more important than he is. So as we worship this day, we pray that God the Holy Spirit would help us to know all the more this wondrous God who would change us through his love, who would make us more and more like him, using us in this world to bring true change as we hold on to that which never changes, the wondrous truth of who our God is. Our worship begins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, Amen. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Let us then confess our sins to God our Father. Most merciful God, we confess that we are by nature sinful and unclean. We have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us, forgive us, renew us, and lead us, so that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways, to the glory of your holy name. Amen. In the mercy of Almighty God, Jesus Christ was given to die for us, and for his sake God forgives us all our sins. To those who believe in Jesus Christ, he gives the power to become the children of God and bestows on them the Holy Spirit. May the Lord, who has begun this good work in us, bring it to completion in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Our first reading today is from Deuteronomy chapter 30. Moses said, See, 
I set before you today life and prosperity, death and destruction. For I command you today to love the Lord your God, to walk in obedience to him, and to keep his commands, decrees, and laws. Then you will live and increase, and the Lord your God will bless you in the land you are entering to possess. But if your heart turns away, and you are not obedient, and if you are drawn away to bow down to other gods and worship them, I declare to you this day that you will certainly be destroyed. You will not live long in the land you are crossing the Jordan to enter and possess. This day I call the heavens and the earth as witnesses against you, that I have set before you life and death, blessings and curses. Now choose life so that you and your children may live and that you may love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him. For the Lord is your life, and he will give you many years in the land he swore to give to your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Our second reading is from Luke chapter 14. Large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and turning to them, he said, If anyone comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, even their own life, such a person cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not carry their cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. Suppose one of you wants to build a tower. Won't you first sit down and estimate the cost to see if you have enough money to complete it? For if you lay the foundation and are not able to finish it, everyone who sees it will ridicule you, saying, this person began to build and wasn't able to finish. Or suppose a king is about to go to war against another king. Won't he first sit down and consider whether he is able with 10,000 men to oppose the one coming against him with 20,000? If he is not able, he will send a delegation while the other is still a long way off and will ask for terms of peace. In the same way, those of you who do not give up everything you have cannot be my disciple. Welcome to Puppet Time with Pastor. Once again, I'm here with my good friends, Jack and Mac. Oh, I am I Jack, and I'm Mac. We're not going to tell. <laughs> all right, all right. So uh, you guys are here two weeks in a row. What's up with that? If something's good, why change it? Yeah, why change excellence? Well, you know, the other puppets we use are quite good, too. But why are you guys here again? Yeah, we have another question. Yeah, last week we asked you why we were here for worship, but now we even have a more important question. A more important question? What could be more important than that? It has to do with Jesus. Yeah, Jesus. Well, what about Jesus? What he just said. Yeah, what you read. Didn't understand it at all. Yep, made absolutely no sense. Oh, yeah, I kind of understand that. What he said doesn't seem to make a lot of sense to us, does it? Because we always think about Jesus telling us to love one another and forgive each other and show mercy and compassion. Yeah, so what was all of that about hating mom and dad? Yeah, and hating brothers and sisters. Yeah, I might have times where I don't like things my brother does, but I never hate him. Yeah, never hate you either, bro. Yeah, well, that's a good thing. So what was Jesus actually saying there? Well, you guys like sports. I like sports. In fact, I'm wearing a shirt with my Brewer logo on it, so let's use a baseball example. What? Baseball example? Yeah. What are you going to do? Talk about how people hate umpires sometimes? Uh, no, we're not going to talk about that. But we are going to talk about a father and son who played together way back when. Their names were Ken Griffey and Ken Griffey Jr. Mm. Father and son, huh? Father and son who played on the same team? Yep, they played on the same team for a while. Can you imagine that? Well, let's pretend that we had a father and a son who 
were on the same team. And let's say that the son was a really, really good pitcher and the dad was a really, really good batter. Good thing they were on the same team. Yeah, I bet they helped them out. Yep, it was very important, wasn't it, that they would be on the same team to use those strengths? But let's pretend there was a trade. And the team made a very difficult trade, but traded the father away to another team. That'd be awful. Yeah, that would be very difficult if they played each other. Yep, it would be very difficult if they played each other. But let's pretend that's what happened. And remember, the father was a really, really good batter. And the son was a really, really good pitcher. And now they had to face each other, against each other, in the same game. And let's say that the game was going to win the World Series. Uh-oh. Yeah, that'd be really, really difficult, wouldn't it? Yeah. I don't know what I'd do. Well, we have to think about it. If you're playing on a particular team, you're committed to that team. Because if you don't do your best, you let everyone else down. And that team is the team that's paying your contract. That's the team that you now, if you will, play for, work for. And so if you're the son, even though you love your father, you're not going to give him a pitch that he's going to easily hit, are you? No, guess not. Yeah, that would hurt my team. I'm committed to my team. Ooh, that's the important word there, Jack. Committed to your team. That's what Jesus is talking about. Jesus uses very strong language, that word hate, in order to get people's attention. And what he's trying to tell us, if we are really going to follow him, it means complete commitment. And that means nothing else can be more important to us than him. And if there would ever be a time, and usually he doesn't call us to do this, but if there would ever be a time where we'd have to maybe move away from mom and dad and, let's say, be a missionary overseas, even though mom and dad might think, oh, don't leave. I don't want to leave you. I don't want to miss you so much. Or let's say God would come and say, hey, you know, I want you to sell everything you have and give that money to the poor and follow me. Hey, didn't he tell someone to do that in the Bible once? Yeah, that rich young man. Yeah, Jesus did that. Remember what the rich young man did? Went away sad. Wouldn't do it. Yep. He wasn't fully committed to Jesus, was he? See, that's what Jesus is talking about. Being fully committed to him, being on his team. Sometimes that means we have to make some very difficult choices. Sometimes it means we have to change some things. But you see, when we follow Jesus, we're never, ever disappointed because he's worth it more than anything else. Why is he worth it to us? Why do we always say thank you to him? Because he forgives us. He died for us. He's merciful, compassionate, loves us forever. Yep, indeed, loves us forever. And so if we're committed to Jesus, we follow him and him alone. He's the most important thing. And, you know, as far as hating mom and dad, brothers and sisters, you know what? Let's turn that around and say, instead say, thank you, God, for giving me a mom and dad, brothers and sisters, others around me, who encourage me to follow you, walk with you, love you more than anything else. And what a blessing that is when we're all committed to following Jesus that way. That's why we again come to worship, because we're committed to him. Say thank you to him. And so our worship continues with the next him. Lord, keep us steadfast in your word. Curb those who by deceit or sword would seek to overthrow your son. What he has done Lord Jesus Christ Your power make known For you are Lord of lords alone Defend your Christendom That we may sing your praise eternal Of Christ 
lesser worth Send peace and unity on earth Support us in our final strife And lead us out of death to life Steadfast in your word Curb those who by deceit or sword Would seek to overthrow your son And to destroy what he has done Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. I have behind me a picture of an old TV show. Do you recognize what it is by seeing this picture of the cast? If you answered Gilligan's Island, you were correct. Now, as you look at the picture, as we go from the left to the right, we see Marianne and Gilligan and then behind them, we have the skipper, and then the professor, and then the actress, Ginger. And right below Ginger, with the hats, we have Mr. and Mrs. Howell, Thurston and Lovey Howell. And they were the wealthy people. Now, you might recall how this worked out. Everyone was leaving Hawaii, going on a three-hour cruise, or so they thought, and then this terrible storm came and blew the minnow way off course, and they ended up on this deserted island. Now, as I watched this program in reruns already, when I would come home from school, there was always one question which bugged me. Here's the question. Why did the Howells have so much luggage for a three-hour cruise? If you remember the TV show, if you watched it, Lovey and Thurston had so many things with them, so many different changes of clothes, other things. It was like, who does that? Who brings all this stuff for a three-hour cruise? Now, of course, it was a TV comedy, and so you can do anything with those things. But if truth be told, we all have a lot of baggage that we carry around. There's some good baggage, there's some bad baggage, but there are things that we just carry around, and it's kind of hard for us to imagine life without these things. We're going to talk about this a little bit today as we continue going through the Acts of the Apostles, and we're going to talk about Acts chapter 15 and the early church having to confront this whole issue of what do we do when some people are saying, hey, we have all these traditions we've always done. We have to do it that way, kind of holding on to a lot of baggage. And we have a lot of new people who are coming in who don't have any clue what those traditions are, don't seem like they apply to them. Do they or don't they? A big discussion that the early church had in Acts 15. So we're going to hear not only about that whole matter, but also how the church resolves it and maybe learn some things for us in our life as we also go through a lot of change in this world and try to determine what is important to hold on to, what's important to let go, and more than anything else in the midst of this, how do we commit, how do we follow Jesus as committed disciples of him? Well, let's get into the text and go to Acts chapter 15. We read in Acts chapter 15, beginning at verse 1, Certain people came down from Judea to Antioch and were teaching the believers, unless you are circumcised, according to the custom taught by Moses, you cannot be saved. This brought Paul and Barnabas 
into sharp dispute and debate with them. So Paul and Barnabas were appointed, along with some other believers, to go up to Jerusalem to see the apostles and elders about this question. The church sent them on their way, and as they traveled through Phoenicia and Samaria, they told how the Gentiles had been converted. This news made all the believers very glad. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and elders, to whom they reported everything God had done through them. Then some of the believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees stood up and said, The Gentiles must be circumcised and require to keep the law of Moses. The apostles and elders met to consider this question. Now, as you were hearing this, you might be thinking to yourselves, hold it, Pharisees and believers, the same? How can that possibly be? Because when we listen to the gospel accounts or the biography accounts of Jesus, we often hear the Pharisees kind of in a negative light, don't we? Because they are the ones who always seem to be picking on Jesus, finding reasons to accuse him of breaking the law. Now, please understand that, first of all, Paul was trained as a Pharisee, was a Pharisee. And in the early church, a lot of Pharisees did actually become believers in Jesus. But, you know, as one might say, once a Lutheran, always a Lutheran, someone might always say, once a Pharisee, always a Pharisee. And what we mean by that is the Pharisees in Jesus' day were kind of the moral majority. They were the ones who wanted to make sure that the nation stayed ethically, morally pure, following the ways of God. And so besides all the laws, the dietary laws, the worship laws that were given in the Old Testament, they actually had added several to make sure that people didn't misinterpret the law and were very careful about doing the things that pleased God. Well, actually, what we have here is a big issue between tradition and change. You know, changing traditions are very, very hard, especially when we hold on to things that we think are very important. So the early church really kind of had to wrestle with this question. Why are we doing what we're doing? See, that is a very important question for all of us, isn't it? Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we worshiping? Well, we talked a little bit about that last week, and we said that worship is worth it ship. Our God is worth it to us, and we come to praise him and, and thank him. But, you know, here today, as we're talking about traditions and change, well, why are we doing what we're doing with those certain traditions? Why are they so important? Are they still important for us today? Are they important enough that everyone who comes in as a new follower of Jesus has to follow those things? Because without them, oh, their faith might be incomplete. That's what the early church was wrestling with here. And so we go on. Picking it up at verse 7. After much discussion, Peter got up and addressed them. Brothers, you know that some time ago, God made a choice among you that the Gentiles might hear from my lips the message of the gospel and believe. God, who knows the heart, showed that he accepted them by giving the Holy Spirit to them, just as he did to us. He did not discriminate between us and them, for he purified their hearts by faith. We believe that it is through the grace of our Lord Jesus that we are saved, just as they are. The whole assembly became silent as they listened to Barnabas and Paul telling about the signs and wonders God had done among the Gentiles through them. When they finished, James spoke up. Brothers, he said, listen to me. Simon has described to us how God first intervened to choose a people for his name from the Gentiles. The words of the prophets are in 
agreement with this. Ooh, the words of the prophets are in agreement with this. And then he goes on and quotes from Amos. Do you see what the early church is doing as they are discussing this whole thing? As they're talking about change. Do we hold on to tradition or do we change things? Is change okay? The question is, is God at work? Is God doing things? Is God working in ways that maybe we didn't expect him to work? Is God changing our way of thinking about things? Because God has the right to do that. So again, we have another question here. Is the change leading to or leading away from Jesus? You see, Jesus is the center of everything for those who are committed followers of his and so we have Peter and James and, and Paul and Barnabas and others, and they're talking about how God is working through his spirit among the Gentiles and how he is leading people to him. How? Not with the works of the law, but because of the message of the cross. The wondrous good news of who Jesus is, the very Son of God, who came to this earth and, yes, followed the law completely, a law which none of us could ever follow perfectly. But Jesus did it. And then Jesus went to the cross as the Lamb of God to do what? Offer himself as a sacrifice. And why were sacrifices necessary? To cover the guilt of sin. All the works of the law, whether it be ceremonial or dietary, could never cover all our sin. There had to be a sacrifice, and Jesus covered that perfect sacrifice with the shedding of his blood. And when he rose victorious, he made clear he's alive and well. He is the very Son of God, just as he claimed the way, the truth, and the life. And as he pours out his spirit, it is very clear he is alive and well among his people. And so God is working, drawing the Gentiles to him. How? Not with the works of the law, but through the good news of the gospel. And so what is the early church learning here? There are a lot of traditions, and traditions have their place, but would it be possible for the traditions to become more important than Jesus, or at best kind of add to Jesus? Like, well, we believe in Jesus, but we also need this and that, because without it, we're not fully Christians. And the early church is deciding, no, that's not the case. It's all about Jesus. So we go on. James says, then, it is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Instead, we should write to them, telling them to abstain from food polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, from the meat of strangled animals, and from blood. For the law of Moses has been preached in every city from the earliest times and is read in the synagogue on every Sabbath. And then James goes on, and in this letter, here's what they write. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us not to burden you with anything beyond. It seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. Now here's the thing. Why did they encourage the Gentiles to abstain from certain things? Because they're thinking about the Jewish believers. The majority of the church at this point is still Jewish, and they had their traditions. And if someone all of a sudden changes everything and kind of snubs those, there's going to be a fence, and what's going to happen is people are not going to think first and foremost about Jesus, but they're going to think about other things, all the changes that are taking place, and the evil one can get in there and use it to move people away from Jesus. And so they're saying, look, it seemed good to us, to the Holy Spirit guiding everything, that you abstain from these things. Why? To do it out of love. Well, I have a word up here, though, that is very important. The word is adiaphora. Here's what the word means. Adiaphora are matters of liberty and choice not directly addressed in the Bible. 
that should not be forced upon others or become a cause of pride and marks of special holiness as compared with others. There are some things which God just does give us freedom about. And a lot of our traditions that we have in the church, things that we might hold near and dear, are just that, traditions. We can't find something in the scriptures that say you have to do this or you have to do that with certain things. So if you think about it, not every church building is the same, is it? And not every church will read the exact same scripture readings every weekend or have the exact same message preached by their pastor or sing the exact same hymns or songs or have the exact same liturgy. There are freedom in certain things. And you see, what the early church was realizing is some traditions are really, really good to hold on to. We can't force them on people, but we can suggest that, you know, maybe for the sake of someone else, you might want to think about certain things. But I also want us to understand this. The doctrine of adiaphora is not an excuse for ignorance. Now listen carefully to what I'm saying. Sometimes in our church education, when we think about our young people growing up in the faith or maybe new believers, one of the things that we do is we share the biography of Jesus. We share his life story through Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we learn all the key things that he did. And then we go and we learn some of the key stories in the Old Testament about people. But sometimes what we don't spend enough time on is the doctrine the teaching. So it's great to know all the stories about Jesus' life, his biography. But then how do we apply this stuff? What about the question we have is, what would God have me do in this situation? You see, we can't just say, oh, it's Adi Afra, God leaves it up to me. If the scriptures clearly lay out, no, this is what God wants us to do. You see, Paul talks about that in 2 Timothy 3. He says, from childhood, Timothy, You have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. You see what this is saying to us? The importance of studying the scriptures And when we have questions, like what the early church was wrestling about, does the Lord lay things out for us clearly? Or are there some matters that are just kind of matters of opinion, maybe even matters of tradition? Well, I have a picture up here. And if you look carefully, you see it's kind of like a thrift shop, might even be someone's garage sale, rummage sale. You have a lot of stuff there. I might look at it and say, man, there's a, there's a lot of junk there. So right in the middle of this picture, there's a picture of a book all about Volkswagen Beetles. Guess what? I own two Volkswagen Beetles like that, same color and everything. So I might go past and say, hey, I would really like this book. Someone else got rid of it saying, I don't want it. Life's kind of like that, isn't there? Some things, some traditions are very, very important to people. Some traditions maybe aren't so important to people. So how do we determine what really is important? Well, it comes down to what's important to God. And so we had this marvelous passage at the end of Deuteronomy 30 today. Love the Lord your God, listen to his voice, and hold fast to him, for the Lord is your life. See, in a very changing world, our God doesn't change in this His love for you and me is so great that he would send our Lord Jesus to be our Savior, and that love doesn't end. And you know what else doesn't change in that love? He doesn't start coming up with new rules and new regulations. He doesn't say, oh, for a while that worked, but I'm going to change everything now. And instead of believing in Jesus, hey, you have to believe in him, but you have to do this, 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 and this too. He's not going to do that. And so we love this God and listen to his voice. And how do we do that? As we hold on to and learn his word. 
because that's where he speaks to us. And we hold fast to him then as we hear that word and say, yeah, I'm committed to that. There might be some things that change in my life, but that's not going to change. And I'm going to hold on to you. Why? Because you are my life. So are we totally committed to him? You know, a lot of things change in this world. And we might be tempted to think, maybe it's time to change how I feel about Jesus. Well, maybe it is. Maybe it's time to take it a little bit more seriously, to ask those questions. Why is he so important? Why are we doing the things we're doing? And to realize this changeless God with his changeless love for you and me has indeed changed everything for us so we can be his now and for all eternity. And so we say, Lord, here I am. Take me. I'm yours because I want to be yours. Now, even as I want to be yours again for all eternity. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you please join me in a word of prayer? Most gracious Heavenly Father, in a world that is filled with constant change, many of which are leading away from you rather than to you, we thank you that you in your love and mercy would come to us through your spirit to change us and others so that we might know the truth of our Lord Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life, and the joy of living as the forgiven, redeemed children of God. We pray for all we know who have been sucked up by various things in this world which have led them away from you. We pray that you would open up their hearts to receive, their minds to understand, and their lives to now live anew in the joy of your salvation. We pray for our world and its leaders asking for guidance and wisdom for our president, Congress, and all judges, our governor and legislature, all of our local officials, for safety and protection for our police officers, sheriffs, firefighters, and all working for the well-being of our communities, for those serving us in our armed forces, especially those who are deployed and their families. According to your good pleasure, please keep us from the attacks of our enemies. And now we pray, Lord, boldly that you would intervene and bring an end to the war in Ukraine. Gracious Lord, we pray for all affected by flooding and other severe weather, as well as droughts. We thank you that when all is said and done, you have a marvelous way of providing what we need from day to day. So teach us to trust in you and to offer you our thanks and praise as we seek to be good citizens who not only take care of the creation you've blessed us with, but seek to take care also of all around us. Gracious Lord, we pray for all we know in need of healing and strength. We pray for all caregivers who need strength, encouragement, and support. And we pray for ourselves that you would watch over us, keeping us in your care, showering us with your love and peace. With great joy, we remember all who have gone before us in the faith. Teach us then to number our days aright, that when our Lord returns, we will be found as good and faithful servants. Into your hands, O Lord, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, 
Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look upon you with his favor and grant you his peace. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for our online worship service this day. God be with you. Have an excellent rest of the day.